I would much rather have diverse enough programming where I'm like, look, if you want to learn how to do a forward roll, we have 20 classes for you. I want to be diverse enough that I can appeal to a wide array of clients without being so diverse that I have no niche. Email is one of the cheapest and best ways to get people who are already interested in your product to start buying. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Cheer Biz Podcast. Today, we are going to be talking about five things that you need to look at if your gym is not growing. Now, if you don't know me, my name is Dan Cotton, and I am the host of the Cheer Biz Podcast. I am a gym owner. I have owned a gym for the past 12 years, and I've grown my gym from when my wife, Tori, and I bought it from 45 only competitive athletes to over 390 active members doing over a million dollars in revenue every single year. And even right now, I am focused on how I can get more members in the gym because we are getting ready to move into a new facility potentially. And with that comes increased cost. And when I have that increased cost in a new facility, I want to make sure that I am bringing in enough revenue to support what it is that I am going to be taking on from an expenses standpoint. I'm really attacking this issue right now. I'm looking at what are the things that I need to be doing to continue to grow my gym. And ultimately, that's what you need to do. You need to make sure that you are continuously focused on growing your gym and making it the best version it can be, bringing in more revenue and bringing in more members. So number one, the first thing I'm going to be looking at, I've talked about it a lot, is I'm going to be looking at my marketing. And when I talk about marketing, there are two different pieces. I'm going to be looking at what is my brand awareness? What is the messaging that I'm putting out there? The free marketing, the organic stuff that I'm doing. And I'm also going to be paying attention to what are the things that I'm doing that are paid marketing channels? And what am I getting the most return on my investment for? Now, there are a million different paid marketing channels. And maybe I should do an entire episode on which channels I would recommend and which channels I wouldn't just from my own personal experience. But we're not going to get into that too much today. Suffice it to say, my main channels are paid in terms of paid meta. So Facebook and Instagram and Google. Those are the two channels that I use to funnel new members into my gym, find people who are interested in our product and market to them. When I'm doing paid marketing, I'm talking about a lot more than what you may think. So what most of us are used to, especially with Facebook, is five years ago, you could run an ad where you threw up a graphic and you threw up some text and you said, hey, we've got this event going or we're offering this new program and you would get people to enroll. In fact, post-COVID, man, you could post borderline nothing and just put an ad out there that you had activities that were gonna get kids out of the house and people were jumping on it because people were looking for those opportunities to get their kids involved in anything that got them out of the house because they'd been inside it for two years. And so we saw a lot of traction for people who weren't even doing great marketing. And the problem is, is that stuff isn't working quite as well anymore. You need to understand what it is from a marketing perspective you should be doing when you're running paid ads. If you're running paid ads, you need to be really, really intelligent about them. You, I recommend having a guide, learning from someone who's been there and done that, because if you do not have a lot of discretionary income, you don't have a true marketing budget, you don't necessarily have the luxury of testing and figuring out what works because you don't have the budget to do that. When you have a budget to do testing, it's wonderful to do split tests and figure out which images and which videos and which texts and which calls to action and all those things. What is it that attracts your perfect client avatar? But if you don't have that luxury, then you need to get someone in your corner who knows what they're doing. Maybe someone who has done that split testing themselves within their business or someone who has worked with lots of businesses and can give you advice. The reality is, is that every demographic is a little bit different. So what's going to work for one demographic or one specific avatar might not work for another. So you do want to be really strategic about that marketing. But ultimately, you need to be diving into your marketing. And that would be number the number one thing I would be doing to grow my gym right 
now and try and get more members in. And in fact, I'm doing it. And the three things that I'm marketing the most are I'm marketing my classes. So I'm marketing my recreational tumbling and cheer programming. I'm marketing my birthday parties. And then I'm marketing our half season teams. And those are really the things that I am focused on at the moment marketing. But rec classes and birthday parties being the number one focuses or kind of shared focuses. Those are what I'm always out there promoting because they're my lowest barrier offer and they're the most likely to get people into the door. The next one would be, what am I going to do? Where am I going to send people? How am I going to get them involved? And so really what I'm looking at is my landing page. Where am I sending people to enroll in my programming? Now, I am an iClass Pro user. I think they have a wonderful suite of options for gyms and they do really outstanding stuff. I do not make new members enroll through iClass Pro. I think they're working on some things to streamline that process, but I haven't found it to be as simple and frictionless as I want it to be. So I am running people all to my landing page to get them to enroll there. They're filling out a form, they're making a payment, and then we're taking care of the iClass stuff a little bit later. Now, does that create more administrative burden on my staff? It does, but I would rather friction be on my staff than be on my clients. So when I look at what my landing page is doing, I want it converting people into paid members. And I mentioned this on the last episode. I love nothing more than waking up in the morning and seeing that I sold a trial, uh, not a trial, but a, a class enrollment or I sold something online and I didn't have to do anything for it. It's a fantastic feeling because your website is now working for you. And landing page website, Generally speaking, not going too far down that rabbit trail can be very different things. So I have a website and I have a landing page and they're not the exact same. My website is more of my billboard, my brand. It, it gives a lot more information. People can still enroll, but it generally is gonna send people to my landing page to enroll. My landing page is where I'm gonna send all of my people, all of my traffic that I want to get to enroll in my programming. You can do this a number of different ways but we're not gonna, that's a whole nother episode that, that we'll go into. So I would be looking at my landing page and with my landing page, I want to know, is it doing the things that I want it to do, which is sending someone who's never been to my products before or doesn't know a lot about me, can get to this landing page, can learn how it is they would enroll, what the benefits are to them, and then take action. Somewhere on that page, I want some sort of a, a lower barrier offer, some sort of an opt-in where I'm going to get in exchange for their email and phone number, I'm going to give them something of value to them, but that doesn't have a high cost for me. And we're going to get that exchange. So even if they don't buy, I can continue to engage with them and get them into my email funnels, which are absolutely wonderful and you need to be using. But I would be really dialing in my landing page. And that's something that I am currently working on right now improving my landing page and taking it to the next level based off of my client avatar and the behaviors that they typically take within my business. Number three is I'm going to look at my email marketing and automations. What am I doing to engage with people who have taken a taste of the facility? They've come for an open gym. They've opted in for something that we offer, whether it be on my landing page or a special event, or they've come for a birthday party, but they haven't committed. They're not a actual monthly paying member giving me reoccurring revenue. So I want to have email campaigns, automations that are going out to those people to engage with them. And when I'm doing that, I want to try and bring value. I mentioned earlier when we talk about marketing, you know, what is your forward facing branding? It's changed quite a bit over the years. Current rule of thumb, which will change, I'm sure, is you want to be doing nine value add posts, content, videos, audio clips, blogs, things like that, that are bringing value to your client's life. Nine of those. One that is at least giving some sort of clarifying identity of who you are as a brand. You know, what is your program? and then one sale. So you're really giving 10 non-sales related things for every one sales related thing because people are going to engage a lot more with content that brings value to their life and they're not going to click on the things that are just sale, sale, sale. So if your entire email automation is enroll, enroll, special event, pay us money, pay us money, pay us this, you're going to get less traction. You will still get people to enroll, you will get people to open, 
but it's going to be far less frequent than if you're sending out a ton of valuable content that people want to open and want to read, then you send out a piece of information that is like, and also you can buy this thing. We've got this special event going on. You've now been selling them by giving them value. And now you're giving them the opportunity to purchase. So I would really be diving into my email automations and how those are going to really positively impact my enrollment because email is one of the cheapest and best ways to get people who are already interested in your product to start buying, to convert those people who are kind of a warm lead to being an actual buyer. So we want to make sure that our email automations are dialed in. Number four is I want to look at what my product delivery is. So I want to be diving into what my programming is and how my staff are delivering it. And I want to make sure that we are creating relationships. I mentioned this on the last episode, but it's friendships over flips. So I want to be making sure that my staff are creating amazing relationships with the athletes and helping athletes make relationships with other athletes in the class because that's when get, what's gonna get them to keep coming month over month over month over month. And like I've mentioned before, we want reoccurring revenue. So the best way to grow my gym is to make sure that I have a true funnel where I have a lot of people coming in at the top and very few people dropping out at the bottom. I want the tightest possible, you know, drip out of the bottom of the funnel that I can have. And I do that by increasing my retention. And I increase my retention by delivering an amazing experience and an amazing product. And it goes much beyond the technique and the skills and those kind of things. That is actually, in my opinion, a tertiary advantage. It is all of the intangibles. I have way more experience getting negative and positive reviews in regard to the cleanliness of my facility, the friendliness of my staff, the care and consideration we show to athletes, the personal attention, the taking time with the new kiddo who's crying. Like those things are the things that build loyalty far more than my kid got their back handspring in two weeks. And that is simply because those things are of more value for most people. Again, you may find those people who really love flips and that's all they want, but generally those people are going to be harder to retain because they're coming to you for a very specific goal. And then once they've accomplished it, they are going to then move on. So I'm going to really dive into what is my product, what is my delivery, and what is my retention so I can really grow my gym and get more members. Plus, if I'm having people come and check things out, whether they're coming in for a tour or they're coming in for a singular paid class or they're doing a paid trial, if I'm doing an amazing job delivering my service and everyone is loving being in the gym and the energy in the gym is electric, then I'm going to be much more likely to retain athletes that are checking things out and get them to enroll, thereby growing my programming substantially. The last thing I'm going to look at and when I'm trying to figure out how to grow my gym is what my general product offerings are and my schedule. I want to be diverse enough that I can appeal to a wide array of clients without being so diverse that I have no niche. So when I say that, I mean, I don't want to be the facility that offers cheerleading and tumbling and gymnastics and dance and parkour and yoga, and this, and uh, baton twirling. And I, I can start to get way too spread out and not really, and then I'm kind of like just doing a whole bunch of things and really not great at anything. No, am I criticizing if you want to do baton twirling and tumbling and dance? Is that wrong? No, it's not. But you need to find your niche and you need to get really, really good at that niche before you look at expanding into anything else. Because what you can do is you can create distractions for yourself that actually aren't going to help your business grow. So we want to make sure that we have a solid niche, but we want to be diverse enough that we are able to get new clients. And some of the things I mean by this are, I don't want to be the facility that is only known for being the absolute best at doing elite tumbling. Now, I say that because that was me. When we first started, we were known as being the place to go learn advanced tumbling skills. We had a world's team. We've trained some of the 
better tumblers in the country. One of my athletes won the tumble off battle in the arena two years in a row. And I trained her basically from her janky full all the way up from there. And so we've developed some really great tumblers, which is super awesome. A lot of pride in that. But how many really great tumblers are out there to take advantage of your class programming? Very, very few. And so if my niche is I train the best tumblers in the world. And that's all I work with is kids that are highly elite. Well, I've now cut my legs out from under me. I would much rather have diverse enough programming where I'm like, look, if you want to learn how to do a forward roll, we have 20 classes for you. And that's within reason, right? You need at least a hundred kids before you start doing close to 20 classes. Otherwise you're doing too many. You want to make sure that you have diverse class offerings throughout the week so it fits within parent schedules and you have diverse enough classes that people can enroll at any level at any time. And I'm going to focus on all five of those things and those five things. And I, like I said, I probably went a little bit backwards. Like you probably want to work on your schedule programming and everything first, and then you want to work on your retention. And then you want to work on your, your website and your landing page and making sure that's going really, really well. Although you can probably work on those two things at the same time and actually email marketing around that frame as well. And then once those are all set, then we actually start paying for marketing because all the other systems are in place. And we're not going to be spending money on marketing that is then just going to waste because people can't enroll or they're sent to a website that doesn't work or they don't get re-engaged when they abandon a cart, right? We want to make sure that all of those things are dialed in and then we start paying for marketing. So really, I went, I told you guys the reverse order. I started with the last thing that you should be doing. But those are the five things that I'm going to be focusing on to grow my gym substantially. And I'm going to be taking massive action. Now, there are a ton of moving parts in this. And if you're a small gym or you're a, a single owner working it by yourself and you need help, there are resources out there. You also may have some staff that have a little bit of experience. You can start to train to do some of these things, but be really cautious. Uh, every teenager thinks that they're an expert at social media or thinks that they know how to do it better than their old gym owner. That doesn't mean that they do. The number of kids or even young staff that I've had be like, oh, uh, let me help with your social media. Let me take it over. And even if they're really good at running their own social media, it doesn't mean that they're going to be amazing at running yours. It doesn't mean that they fully understand your brand. It doesn't mean that they know how to create a strategy. It doesn't mean that they understand the concept of nine, one, and one, and you know, having those 10 posts that are engaging with the one sale, they may not know how to do those things. So just because they have a following because they're pretty or they post really cute pictures or they make really funny TikTok videos doesn't mean that that's going to translate into your business. So you want to make sure that you're getting advice from people who actually know what they're doing and have the repetitions because I've listened to teenagers and, and I made those mistakes when I was younger in my business years and letting kiddos take things over and it just never really worked out the way you wanted. And they're not going to build the systems the way you need them to be built. So be cautious in, in how you use that. But I know it can be really overwhelming. There are resources out there. And if you can figure this out, and if you can get all of those systems in place, you can figure out your programming and scheduling, you can figure out your retention and product delivery, you can dial in your email automations, you can have an exceptional website and exceptional landing page, and you can run effective paid marketing. You guys, the market is open for you. In the youth sports industry, the market is wide open. There aren't a lot of people doing this really, really well. Okay. And if you start to, you will be one of the first people to market to really be doing this effectively and you will see results whether you're in a massive town or you're in a little town there are ways to do it and i highly recommend that you use all of the products that we have out there and you look at getting an academy coach because we have the experience in every market in the US and in Canada, small town, big town, all of it, we've split tested, we've done a whole bunch of different things. And you can learn from all of that without going through all of the pain and suffering yourself. You're still going to have struggle. It's still going to be hard. It's never easy to run a business, but there are some really amazing ways that you can be growing your business right now. And to be honest, when I'm recording this in October, now is the time. We see our biggest bumps in enrollment September, October, it starts to die off in November. You'll see a little bit more in December. I'm just going with trends. And then January, we pick back up all the way. And then, then we see some dips in the summer. But you've got to be thinking seven moves ahead. So in October, if you're not starting to think about 
what it's going to look like for next summer and what programming you're going to be offering and how you're going to offset knowing that you might have some drops in recreational reoccurring tumbling because it's summertime and people want to pause or go on trips or go to Europe and Greece and all those fun things, then you you're going to be behind the curve. If you start trying to think of that in April, because now we're not building a strategic cohesive plan to have everything set up, start marketing, start creating awareness, start getting enrollments. So I highly recommend you get some help. All right, everyone. So I hope you got something out of this. Those are the five things that I would be doing to grow my business right now. And in fact, are the five things that I am focusing on right now to grow my gym as I prepare to launch into the next phase of gym ownership. Thank you everyone for listening. And with that, we'll catch you on the next episode. Oh,